Please remember there are additional resources and things such as code samples at elithecomputerguy.com. So if you're watching one of these classes and you need to know what code looks like, or if you need the links to the resources that we're using, please go to elithecomputerguy.com and take a look at our class posting there. Also, please remember that free to the end user classes are not actually free. It costs me a lot of money to be able to provide this type of content. So if you could click on the donate button and throw in a couple of dollars every month. This will help me be able to continue to provide you this type of material. Welcome back. As you know, I am Eli the Computer Guy, and in today's class, we're going to be learning how to filter variables in Python. So normally when you're talking about filtering variables, you will also talk about sanitizing variables. So in today's class, we're only going to be discussing how to filter variables. And so what filtering variables does is basically it doesn't allow you to input uh, variable values that don't align with whatever the coder wants, <clears throat> right? So if somebody uh, wants to know what your age is, you don't want them to be able to plug in what the person person's name is instead. So basically, if the uh, program asks for age and you plug in Bob, you want a filter to reject that and then re-request an appropriate age from the user, right? So if you're asking for an email address, uh, you don't want a website. Uh, if you're asking for a social security number, you don't want a telephone number. Uh, so what we're talking about here is when we're filtering variables, what we're doing is we're looking at the variable value that comes in and if it's not what we're expecting, if it doesn't have the format that we're expecting, we will kick it back to the user to say, please give us the appropriate information. This is different than sanitizing variable values. So what sanitization does, and again, we'll have a class on this later, is basically it goes through and it looks at the user input that was provided, and then it just strips out uh, all of the garbage. Uh, sanitization is something that you may have noticed on uh, billboards, right? <clears throat> so so if you go to an internet billboard service and you go to type in a message, in the old days you were able to put in HTML tags, right? So you could go to somebody else's uh, internet bulletin board, uh, you could type out whatever message that you wanted to type out, but inside that you could put an iframe uh, to, try to, to try to open up a little page on some other website, you could use CSS, you might even be able to do JavaScript. So within that little message bubble that that, that, that billboard service gave you, you were able to do a lot of modifications. Well, right, that's not necessarily what people want, especially uh, in administrators of sites. There's a whole bunch of, you know, worries about hacking and spamming and that type of thing. And so what sanitization does is basically it can go through and it can literally just simply rip out all of the HTML tags. So you sit there and you type out, you know, this big, uh, this big response with all these pretty HTML and CSS tags and, and all that stuff. You put it into the billboard service, you hit submit. They have a sanitization function that will go in or rip out all of the HTML HTML tags and only post the actual text uh, that you're supposed to be posting, and that's what sanitization is. So what a filter would do, a filter would see those HTML tags, and then it would stop and it would say, no, we can't accept anything other than clean text, please put in clean text. So a filter stops you from inputting data into the system, essentially sanitization takes the data that's input in the system and then cleans it up to put it into a format so that there's less risk or whatever for the underlying infrastructure. So when we think about filtering and we think about sanitization, we do need to be thinking about our overall application and what that's going to look like. So generally, whenever you're dealing with an application, whether it's a web app, uh, even many times if it's a mobile app or whatever, uh, essentially you have the front end. Uh, so you have something like the web page that people will go to. Uh, you then have the back end server, which is probably uh, engine X at this point. So this is the web server that provides uh, the web page uh, to the end user. And on the engine X server, again, for us would be Python, uh, but maybe you would have something like Ruby or you'd have PHP or whatever. And then there's also the data store, what we call the data store, and this is most likely something like a database. Uh, so a MySQL database, a Postgres database, some type of database system, there will be a database server. So this will contain all of the records for the user accounts, the messages, whatever else. 
when somebody goes to the web page, the web server will request information from the database and then send it to the web page so that the user can see it. When the user submits information, that information will go to the web page, that will then go through the, the, the Nginx server, which will then send the information to the database server. Now what's really important is we really, really, really care about this database server, right? We want to make sure the data that's inside this database server is as clean and as pristine as possible. Again, when you're going through and you're doing uh, database routines, like something as simple, something as simple as adding up all of the prices or all of the, the purchases that people have made over the day, right? If you're, if you're trying to figure out what the total amount that customers have purchased through the day are, and then what the average value of a sale is for your, your company, you would do what's called a, a select statement. So you would simply go through, you would select uh, all of the total values for the day, you would add that up to give the total value, and then you'd divide that by however many transactions to give the average value. Well, what happens? <laughs> What happens if the first price is $111 and that's $512 and that's $12.50 and then it's Bob and then it's $312, right? How do you, how do you add Bob to 111? Well, hopefully that'll fail. Hopefully in the database itself, it will fail. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes you actually can add Bob to 111 and everything at that point goes to hell. And so one of the things is when you have the database server, you are going to input into that column what the data type is supposed to be. Is it supposed to be a character? Generally, like if you're dealing with uh, MySQL, is it supposed to be ints? Is it supposed to be floats? Is it supposed to be date time? Generally, again, if you're dealing with MySQL or a relational database, you'll tell it what data type it's supposed to expect. And then if it doesn't receive that data type, it should fail out and should not allow the insert, the adding the record to happen. But one of the things you need to be thinking about, again, as a real technology professional, is that you want to create layers. You want to create layers, right? Your system should be designed in such a way that one of your layers can absolutely and utterly fail, but the integrity of the system still functions properly. And so how you do that is you have every layer in the process do its own filter and sanitization, right? So if you're dealing, again, if you're dealing with a web page, so basically on the web page itself, you would use something called JavaScript. So JavaScript is a front end programming language. And when people are plugging information into the form, if, if it doesn't doesn't look how it's supposed to look, it should get flagged and on the form itself, right? It, you should basically just see the, the, the form and then you'll, you'll have like red or something to highlight where your errors are. And it will say, we can't send until these values are fixed, right? And so that's filtering on the JavaScript side. But then when that information comes in, again, think about this. What if you have a hacker or what if you just have some kind of weird bad program somehow? And so the wrong information gets sent to your Nginx server, again, to your Python script. Well, then what you want in Python script, when the values come into the Python script, the Python script should also validate and filter the values come in to make sure that they're up to snuff before that they get sent to the database. So basically Python should go through, it should look at everything, make sure you know an email address looks like an email address, a phone number looks like a phone number, the whole nine yards. If it's okay, it'll send it through. If not, it'll bounce it back and then you have a routine. And then finally, again, like I say, you have the database server and the database server itself, uh, you'll actually be able to assign data types to the specific columns. So if somebody tries to put Bob into a column that's only supposed to have floats, that should fail. So basically when you try to do the insert, that would fail and then you should set up a routine uh, for people re, you know, plug their information back in uh, to the front end. And so this is one of the things that you need to be thinking about uh, when you're going to be designing these systems. And again, that's where I talk about new people. New people are like, what language do I need to know? Here's the thing, even if you're an expert in Python or Ruby or whatever else, I've actually met a few Ruby. Ruby seems to be coming back. It's a shock, I don't know why. You know, you're an expert on Python or Ruby or even PHP or whatever. One of the things is you need to at least understand how all of this is supposed to work so that when you're interacting with your peers that are designing the other components of the system, you can all make sure that you're on the same page and that you don't run into any issues. 
Or again, maybe if you're in a startup company or maybe if you just have some lazy peers and they simply want, they just simply want one layer to do all the filtering and sanitization, that might be a time to go to your, go grab a, a coffee and go talk to your boss and say, hey, I'm concerned about how we're designing the system because if we only, if we only have security at one layer and that layer fails for whatever reason, that could, uh, that could add a whole bunch of vulnerabilities uh, to what we're trying to do. It seems like the JavaScript people and the database people, you know, need to kind of get on, on board with what we're doing. And so that's one of the things that you might have to do too. So when you're doing this kind of thing, again, think about the whole layering system and how all of this will work as one thing. Now, finally, before we get into the demonstrations, I know some people, when we go into the demonstrations, they'll be like, what about regex? Right, so regex is called regular expressions. There is a regex module for Python that is very awesome and also kind of a pain in the ass to use. Uh, the way I explain regex, regex is to programmers as subnet masking is to sysadmins. Like we know how to do it, but for some reason we all groan whenever it comes up. Again, think about that, right? MCSE or whatever the hell, hell they're called anymore. You ask them to create you know, custom subnets and they know how to do the math. It's actually not that complicated, but they will just start groaning. There's just something about it, right? And the same thing is true with the regex. So with regular expressions or regex, basically what this allows you to do is you, it allows you to do pattern matching uh, within documents or within uh, basically variable values uh, to pull out or look for very specific information. Again, things like email addresses, things like social security numbers, all of that kind of stuff. Basically, you can create regex uh, statements that will look for these specific things, and then if they exist, if they don't exist, pull out those values, whatever else. That one, that's its own class. That'll literally be its own, like 30, 40, 40 minute to an hour long class. And then two, even when you know it's a bit of a pain in the butt. Uh, one of the things I like about ChatGPT, I do use ChatGPT for doing things like, what is the regex for looking for blah? Uh, and it will give me the regex that I'm looking for. And so that gets to be a little bit complicated. So what I'm showing you today with this basic filtering routine is I'm just showing you uh, how to use very simple methods, how to use very simple functions in order to do a basic filtering system. And then the idea being, if you need to do something more complicated with filtering, that's when, again, you go through the regex class and you look at so, some things that other people have done and you figure out a more complicated system for what you're doing. Uh, so is regex important? Yes, absolutely. Is regex a good addition to what I'm teaching you today? Yes, I'm simply not going there right now because this is own can of worms. So here is our filtering script. And so for today's class, I actually have all of the functions written out in one script so that you can play with them. Uh, easier just to see how they all kind of fit together. Uh, we have a get name function here that's basically going to filter to make sure your name is, is alpha. That's an alphabet name. Uh, we have a get age function here that's going to try to see if the age that you provide is an integer. Uh, we have a get phone number here that's going to try to determine uh, if the if what you gave was a phone number, and then down here we have the get email address. And again, this this is one of the things where regex would actually probably be better, but. This is, a, this is a simple way of doing it to basically determine if what they inputted is an actual email address. Uh, and then we come down here. This is where we call the functions. And then this is where we print out the values. And at the end, we can simply have user information with all of the user information that we've provided. So I just want to kind of show you here how this kind of works before we get into the code. So I just simply hit run here. And as you can see, it's going to ask for my name. Now, if I type in 90 instead of name, what it's going to do is says only letters are allowed for names and then asks me my name again. So I can do Bob. Okay, so it printed out Bob. So I put in Bob, just prints out Bob. What is my age? I fat finger it, so I put in Bob as age. I hit this. Only numbers are allowed for age. Uh, so then I put in 99, right? Uh, then it's going to ask for the phone number. So a phone number has to be 10 to 11 digits. So one, two, three. One, two, three, one, two. So we don't put enough digits in. Uh, then it says numbers must be uh, 10 to 11 digits. So I can do uh, one, two, three, one, two, three, 
one, two, three, four, and then I hit enter. And so that gave me uh, the phone number. So that actually got inputted. And then if I try to do Bob, let's say at Bob for my email address, that's actually not gonna work. Enter a valid email address because Bob at Bob isn't gonna work. So Bob at Bob.com. I do that, and so we get bob at bob.com, user info, bob99, phone number, bob at bob.com. And so that's what the filtering process is, right? When I put in a data that is wrong, uh, that we're not looking for, then, we, uh, then it's going to basically kick me back, and it's going to say, please give me the information that I actually want. Uh, let me comment uh, these out for a second, or actually, let me just comment the prints out so they just don't show they, they stop showing up just so we can see what's going on here okay so the first thing that we're going to do so this is um this is folding code so you can actually set this up in vs code if it's not already set up so when you have everything tabbed out like this one of the nice parts is if you click on these little arrows you can actually fold the code so it folds down on itself um, so this makes it easier to, to go through code and figure out what's going on. Uh, so anyways, okay, so down here we have username equals get underscore name as the function. So this is the, the, the get underscore name function. We're going to do a while true loop here. Well, oh, dangerous. We're living on the wild side. Anyways, again, I will remind you while true loops are incredibly dangerous. So do make sure you know what you're doing when you write them. So what a while true loop means, it will continuously go until something breaks that particular loop. Uh, here, we're gonna have a return value uh, if the, the name is only uh, uh, alphabet letters, and so that's what's gonna break us out of the loop. But do be careful with this if you have API calls or something in here, while true loops can be a little bit dangerous. So what a while true loop is essentially gonna do is it's going to continuously loop asking for a name, for a proper name, until we give it a proper name Name, and then it will spit back the, the name once we've done that. So while true, name equals the input function, and we're going to ask for the name, right? So basically, when we do this, right, so I click on the input, uh, input function, and it's going to ask for the name, right? So uh, if, uh, if the name is alpha, then it, it's alphabetical, then it will go through. So if I do Bob, it will go through as I showed you before. On the other hand, if I do 99, it's not alphabet, so it'll say print only letters are allowed for names, right? So basically what this is here, so name equals the input. So the input is the value that I put in. If name period is alpha, so this is alphabet, if it's alphabet, return the name value. So when we return the name value, that's going to go down to that function call and then we'll be able to print it out. Else, print, only letters are allowed, go back through the loop and then ask for the name again, go back through the loop and ask for the name again, go back through the loop, so on and so forth. And so this is a very simple thing. Again, if you're just looking for names, you can say, you know, is, is it in the alphabet, right? That's one of the things that you can do. Then we're gonna fold this then we're going to go to get age, right? Let me scroll this down a little bit. So once I put in uh, Bob, it'll then ask me uh, for the age. And so what this is gonna do here is again, we're gonna have a while true loop again. So while true, we're gonna continuously ask until we get what we're looking for. The return, when we do the return, this breaks the loop and it returns the variable value. So while true, age equals input age. Right? So it's going to ask us for the age. Try age equals int age. So int is going to try to turn age into an integer. So input, again, we talked about that data type before. When you use the input function, the default data type is string. So even if you type in 99, it is 99 as a data type of string. So you got to be careful with that. So what we're going to do is we put in 99, and then we try to turn 99 into an int, or even 99.5 into an int, that will work, and that value will be assigned to age, and then we'll turn to age, right? 99 can be turned into an int, so assign the value to age. 99 and a half can also be turned into an int, but you'll rip off that, the final decimal point, so it'll only be 99, and that can be assigned to age. Bob cannot be turned into an int, 
and so it will fail. Again, so try to turn a into an int. If that doesn't work, do an accept, right? That try accept, print only numbers are allowed for age, and then this will loop through and it will ask you for the age again. Um, so if we go through, and again, um, we say Bob for age, only numbers are allowed, and then we type in 88 for age. Uh, then we come down here and it's gonna ask for the phone number. So we go to phone number and we take a look at this particular function. This function gets a little bit longer. Um, okay, so with this function, make sure we got all of that here, all right? So define get phone, so while true, phone equals input the phone number. So it's gonna ask me for the phone number down here. Then one of the things is when somebody plugs in the phone number, they might add uh, additional information that you don't want, things like hyphens. So we're gonna do a little bit of sanitization. We're just gonna do it, it's just a sui of sanitization in this particular function. So replace, what replace does is, so you get the phone number. If somebody has put hyphens in the phone number, we're gonna replace all of the hyphens with nothing. So phone dot replace hyphen nothing. So this is single quotation mark, another single quotation mark done. There's no space in between. Just single quotation mark, single quotation mark. And so that's one of the ways you can like sanitize. Again, we talk about sanitizing variable values. You clean out crap that you don't want. So we're gonna clean out the hyphens if they're there. If len, so what len does is it looks at the length of the variable value that you're putting in. So phone, right? So if the length, length of phone is equal to 10, so again, we're just doing this here in the US, or length of phone equals 11. So if you just put in your area code and phone number, that would be 10. If you put one plus your area code and phone number, that would be 11. So if the length of phone is 10 or the length of phone is 11, try to turn the, the, the phone number into an int, right? So that should be a whole number once we've taken out the hyphens. If it is, so basically it's 10 or 11 digits long and it's only uh, numbers, then return the phone number as a phone number. Again, very basic filter system, except print phone numbers must be, uh, must be numeric digits, right? So we have a 10 or 11 digit phone number, uh, but it can't be turned into an int, right? So like with this, let's say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, right? So we put a B in there. So we have this except phone numbers must be numeric digits, right? So if it's ten or eleven with a, with an alphabet it'll get it'll get punched out. If it's only uh, numbers, but it's not ten or eleven. We'll come down to this else statement. Phone numbers must be 10 to 11 digits, right? And so we have two different types of errors in there. So this is within the try statement, and this is within the if else statement. And again, that's kind of when the way is we combine these things. So if I do one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, so that would be a phone number. I can hit enter and it simply accepts uh, the email address at this point in time. Uh, and then we come down um, to, oops, password's gone. Uh, then we come down to the email. Let me just delete that real quick. Uh, and so for email, we're going to be trying to do a basic filter for an email address. Uh, so while true, again, looping through while true, uh, email equals input asking for email address if there is that, that at symbol, right? That's one of the things you need in an email address, in email, and a period in email. So this is a very simple filter. So if you have an at, so bob at aol.com, if you have an at and you have a dot, then it'll work. Return email, else please enter a valid email address. So if I, oh, yeah. where are we at? So if I simply go down here and I type bob, that will fail. Please put an email address. If I do at uh, Bob, that will fail. If I do Bob at AOL.com, that will go through. And so that was able to be taken uh, by this filter. And so that's what you're looking at uh, when you're filtering uh, the data that is going to be coming in uh, into your particular script. Again, think about this with any kind of user input or if you're pulling data again from API sources. Remember, never assume anything, right? To assume makes an ass of you and me. 
or as I say, dis, uh, distrust, verify, and stay suspicious. A lot of people, when they're doing things like making API calls, they just assume that the response that they're getting from the API call is going to be appropriate. And again, when I say appropriate, I don't mean NSFW. I just mean that it's supposed to be whatever data it's supposed to be. Sometimes things get screwed up, right? Sometimes you make an API call and their system screws up and just provides you some garbage back. You want to try to make sure as much as possible that you're not inputting garbage into your system. If you make an API call, you get garbage, your system should fail, and then re-request or redo that particular API call uh, to, to make sure things work properly. Um, and so again, and this is just a simple way that you do it. Uh, all these functions or methods, again, it's the kind of thing that you can do a Google search. There's all, again, Python, as I would say, as I say in Python, there's 20 ways to skin a cat. There's just a ton of different ways to do most, almost the exact same thing. So with this, with name, I used is alpha. There are other ways that you could do that. Again, coming down here, you know, we turn the age into an, or we try to turn the age into an int, you know, doing, doing the try except, we do the while true here. Again, the phone number, we do a bit of sanitization. So we try to clean the phone number. We replace, you know, any hyphens with no spaces. We then ask if the phone number is a length of 10 or a length of 11. We then come through, we try to turn that value that comes in to an int if we can't do that we say they need, need to be you know simply numeric numbers and again down here with the email address we're simply going to ask if there's an at in it and if there's a dot in it and if so we are going to accept that and so again we come down here and I uncomment out and I comment on a couple of things so again we can have name so I can say Bob one right because people might be thinking display names oh I'm gonna put it in display name I don't want display name I just, I just simply want uh, your actual name. So I don't want Bob one, I want Bob. I need an age, I'll say old, because I'm being funny. I don't want old, I want an age, 99. I want a phone number. I don't know, you put in something weird. 1-800, um, I'm cool. That must be numeric digits. And so I say one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, four. And again, this is one of the things you'll notice with a lot of web forms, you'll be able to do stuff like this and it works. And again, because it's their filter is kind of crappy. Uh, an email address, I say no. I say yes, you will. So I say, okay, Bob at AOL.com. Um, I do apologize if there's somebody out there who actually has an email address of Bob at AOL.com. You're getting all of my spam. <laughs> Sad, but true. Uh, and then it simply prints out the information, right? So this information you could be putting into a database statement or whatever else. You have the name, you have the age, you have the phone number, and you have the email address, and they are relatively clean. But one of the things I really do need you to be thinking about with this is that, again, nothing magically happens. Again, one of the big problems, even with technology professionals, is there's this tendency to still kind of sort of think magic is real, like magic. Again, when you look at all of this, realize you have to code everything out. And just because something gets past a filter doesn't mean it's real. Again, 111-222-3333, this passes, you know, almost all phone number filters that I've seen, but obviously that is not a real phone number. Again, bob at bob.com or bob at aol.com. Again, that passes you know, the filter, but that's not actually uh, valid. It's not actually a real address. I hope not. <laughs> Maybe it actually is. So one of the things that you need to be thinking about is, again, how specific with the filter do you need to be? And then how you are going to code everything for the filter, because everything you're going to filter off of, you actually have to write all of that out and then verify that it works. Uh, and then you play with these filters and make sure you don't run into the edge cases. Uh, it's like an edge case I saw with a filter back in the day. So, oh, I had a website or I had a domain name back in the day called starvinggeek.info. So I bought this, I bought this domain name 992000. And so they're the dot coms and the dot orgs, but this is when they were releasing all of the new dot dot names, right? And so it was supposed to be a land grab. And so I looked at it and I went, wow, dot info, right? That's that's got to be one of the next hot, you know, dot, dot extensions or whatever. Uh, the funny part was, is one, it wasn't. Again, as we've learned over the past 30 years, you either have a dot com domain name or you don't. 
there are the dot coms, and then there's everybody else. So the first thing was, if you don't have the dot com, it's a piece of crap name. The other thing is since it was four letters, right? So most dot biz, dot net, dot org, dot edu, dot gov, dot com, those are all three letters, dot three letters. One of the issues that I ran into many times since I had my email address tied to it is dot info is four. So they were looking for something with an at, something with a dot, and then four or three characters, right? Dot com, dot biz, whatever else. They didn't care as long as it was three characters. My problem was, even though I had a legitimate email address, it was info.info, which are very few four characters, uh, extensions at that time. Um, and so many times I was not able to use web applications because they would say, please give us a valid email address. Like it is a valid email address. And they say, please give us a valid email address. I'm like, but it is a valid email address. And then you sit there screaming at a web page and that just goes around and around. <laughs> not necessarily a useful thing. So anyways, there you go. There's some, there some basic thoughts and, and how to uh, code uh, these, uh, these, these filters uh, for variables in Python. So filtering variables is the type of skill that's going to become more and more important as we start building larger and larger projects. Uh, again, in one of the previous classes, uh, we had... Um, Oh, we had we built a little system to basically continuously ping different IP address or host names, and I showed you that if you ping the, the a real IP address, it works, and if you ping a bad host name, it doesn't work. But that's the type of thing that you may not want in your system. You may only want to put into your system things like host names that will actually work. And so one of the things you might might put in is you might do a filter to essentially again this is most likely to be with regex uh, to say okay I need something that looks like an IP address or I need something that looks like a fully qualified domain name if you didn't give me one of those two things then I'm gonna fail and ask you for what the, the type of information that I actually need and so that's the kind of thing that you need to think about do you want do you want the user to fail once they're already inside your application doing whatever and you start spinning up all these failures or would you rather their failure be initially as they're inputting the information so that they know there's a failure they can modify before they go any further and life can be a lot easier, right? These are some of the design considerations that you need to think about. Again, once you start building much larger uh, projects, uh, again, thinking about the layers, right? Every layer in your system should be having the filtering and should be having the sanitization, right? The database, you need to make sure the data types are set up properly for your columns in the database. But then using JavaScript or whatever else, when somebody plugs in information, you need to make sure it looks how it's supposed to look. Then when it goes to Python, you need to make sure a hacker didn't do something so they can try to inject additional information. So when it gets to the Python, then that should be able to do filter and sanitization. And then once that's done, then it gets sent to the database. If everything looks proper, then it gets dumped in the database. If not, basically you reject it and you go through the system again. This is the kind of thing that you need to be thinking about. One of the big problems that I see with a lot of new technology professionals, even a lot of old technology professionals, is they don't design things based off of layers. They just design, they just design one, one component to do whatever, right? We're going to do all the filtering, all the sanitization just on the back end language, or we're going to do all the filtering just at the front end language. And the problem is, is that if there is a failure in one of those, or if somebody gets around it, then they can get all the way to your database server and <laughs> many sleepless nights ensue. Uh, you don't want that type of thing. So anyways, that's all we're talking about, uh, with these, uh, with these, uh, Filter and filtering variables. Again, uh, with this, we're using the input function a little bit more. We're learning, we're creating our own custom uh, functions in order to be able to analyze the variables that are coming in, and we output uh, the results of those functions. And overall, I think it's a pretty, pretty nifty, neat little thing you can do with Python. Uh, so, as always, I enjoy teaching this class, and look forward to seeing the next one.